Welcome everyone to the Australian German Climate and Energy College. Great to have you here. Today we have a seminar from a visitor from uh, University of Birmingham, Gavin Harper, who will be talking to us about uh, a range of activities that are going on at, at Birmingham. Uh, Gavin's here uh, looking for uh, opportunities for collaboration and to you know, find out in general what's going on here in Melbourne. Uh, a little bit of background on Gavin. He's got a, an undergraduate degree in wind engineering. He's got a, an MBA and as I understand it, two master's degrees in sustainable architecture and renewable energy systems. So he's very well qualified in this space. Um, rather than me trying to remember everything, I'll let you introduce yourself as to what your current role is. And uh, you know, very welcome, Gavin. Thanks for your presentation. Cheers. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, so yeah, my name is Gavin Harper. I'm Energy Development Manager at the Birmingham Energy Institute. My PhD research was looking at um, companies introducing ultra low emission vehicles into the UK marketplace, looking at socio-technical transitions and their different business models. Um, I'm now working in a professional services role as Energy Development Manager at the University of Birmingham. I've been there for three years. I've taken the Birmingham Energy Institute from its infancy um, as a collection of different research centres and tried to build and develop that under the academic directorship of Professor Martin Freer um, to create where we are today. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Birmingham Energy Institute and then focus on some specific areas where we think there's some really interesting research opportunities and there we go. So yeah, sorry, uh, uh, the fonts may have gone a little bit awry in translation here. Um, but yeah, Energy Innovation, Birmingham Beyond. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the things that are happening at Birmingham and also some of our wider partnerships. Um, that was one of our newspapers. There should be a copy on the... Um, there's a couple of memory sticks floating around with brochures and paper literature about the Energy Institute. So I'm sure that there's the possibility to circulate those on a Dropbox or something after um, we put together this newspaper about some of the work that's going on at Birmingham. In terms of the Birmingham Energy Institute, it cuts a broad swathe across the university. Um, Birmingham is a large civic university of substantial scale. Our activities are largely rooted in the schools of engineering and physical sciences. There's lots of work on energy storage. Um, Birmingham traditionally um, has played a leading role in the UK's nuclear industry from very early on. Now, work in the nuclear space tends to focus more around um, safety and decommissioning. Um, there's stuff around some strategic elements and critical materials that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Energy storage, with a big emphasis on thermal, um, on um, and increasingly we're looking at battery technology, but not so much on the deployment, but on the recycling of lithium ion batteries and what to do at the end of life. Um, hydrogen and fuel cells has been another area where there's been um, a lot of activity in Birmingham. We've got our own hydrogen filling station on campus. Um, it was one of the first in the UK. We had a fleet of small hydrogen vehicles, micro cabs, um, that have been running around on campus for some time. And more recently, we're trialling some of the more modern hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles from some of the major vehicle manufacturers on campus. And then also, one of the things that we're trying to do is bridge between that sort of engineering and physical sciences base and the more sort of multidisciplinary economics, environmental management. And there's a lot of work that's starting to happen around energy law and regulation because there's a very dynamic head of the law school um, who's very sort of rooted in terms of his own personal research interests in sustainability. So this was our birthday cake around this time last year when we were two years old. Um, a year has passed since this slide. We've not had another staff get together since, um, but we're now three. Um, so, you know, compared to Melbourne Energy Institute, we've got a little bit of catching up to do, but we feel like we've covered a, a lot of ground in, in that time. And so in terms of our footprint and profile, um, we say that we've got 140 academics in energy and energy related areas across the university. Um, this figure is perhaps a little bit out of date. The £75 million in active research grants, we think next year it will be nearer to £100 million um, because we've had some big wins recently, um, which have really given a lot of strength to our elbow. Um, Birmingham Centre for Energy Storage. So Adriano Schiacovelli, um, one of the colleagues that I believe has had links with Melbourne, works for this research centre. 
one of our big assets in the top right hand corner is the high view liquid air energy storage plant so i'm going to talk a little bit later about the policy commission that we've done doing cold smarter one of the things where birmingham's got real strength is in this idea of cold economy so we focus a lot on electricity we focus less on heating and I'm, I'm not talking about Birmingham I'm talking about as a nation as a as a world you know electricity gets top billing thermal in terms of heat we consider less um, it's the, the sort of poor relation of electricity and one of the things that we've made the case for at Birmingham within the UK is to say actually we really don't give cooling and refrigeration enough attention by far and Actually, if you want to look towards modern energy systems, we need to give a lot more thought to how we're going to provide cooling and refrigeration in the future. And one of the things that we might want to consider is using liquid nitrogen as an energy vector. So we've got interest in two firms. One of them is that we work with Highview Energy Storage, who are looking at storing electrical energy in the form of liquid nitrogen in the tank. And with that, we can then generate combined cold and power as opposed to combined heat and power. Another firm that we work with um, is a startup firm that's grown rapidly, the Diamond Engine Company, I'm going to show you a bit about that later, which is a novel engine that runs on liquid nitrogen. Labs down below, lots of work on the characterization of phase change materials across a range of scales and um, different temperature ranges. So this is sort of a footprint of stuff within the School of Chemical Engineering, um, the Energy Research Accelerator has been one of the things that's given us massive strength in the field of thermal energy research. So this is a coalition between six different Midlands universities, um, University of Birmingham, University of Nottingham and the University of Warwick are three of the sort of bigger partners within that coalition. There's also Leicester, Loughborough and Aston University. This was a big investment, £60 million by government, 120 million match funding from industry into this coalition of universities. Birmingham has led the charge on the thermal energy dimension of this project. The other one, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, the other elements are geoenergy, which has been led by Nottingham, and integrated energy, which is around batteries, grids, that's been led by University of Warwick. So in terms of the sort of thermal challenge, we're saying that there's been this historic failure to get to grips with, you know, what's a massive part of our energy system. And we spend so much money on heating and, and, and that's been an area of focus, but we need to do um, things different in terms of our technology options. And so within Birmingham, within the city of Birmingham, the university is obviously involved in, in different projects within the region. There's a long established district heating network within the city. Um, so this links together some sort of key bits. This area, Paradise Circus, is currently a massive redevelopment project within the city. The town hall, the council house, sort of civic centre of the city, the International Convention Centre and the National Indoor Arena. Um, and so these are all linked together. And at the moment, this use is fairly conventional plant. But at the university, we were interested in how we might do other things with this in terms of integration of thermal energy storage with phase change materials, more modern plant. And then the big opportunity within Birmingham is that there's a, a big UK national infrastructure project called High Speed 2 to build a high speed transport corridor between London and the Midlands. There'll be a new station terminus in Birmingham at Curzon Street and around that there are massive plans for regeneration and new building within that area. And so this fits within the context of a wider regional project that the university's catalyzed called Energy Capital, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So on a local level, we see the opportunity for thermal energy. Um, but we've been trying to make the case to, to policymakers that on a national level, this is something that we need to consider. And also within the UK market, um, if we work and develop these technologies, there's a great export opportunity there. And so this policy commission doing Cold Smarter is something where we convened Lord Teverson as a chair and a wide group of experts to look at cold cooling refrigeration and how we might do that more intelligently and one of the things that came out of that report and i think this was research from a netherlands organization is if you look globally 
at users of cold and cooling and you look at how fast countries that are developing are starting to consume cold and cooling so in 2010 the t Chinese consumers bought more air conditioning units than the current fleet in America so this is scary growth because of you know different climates the line of energy consumption for cold and cooling could very rapidly overtake um, the energy consumption that we currently use for heating where the, the growth is slower and if we do that with the present range of technologies um, the environmental effects could be uh, astonishing and ruinous both from an energy consumption point of view um, in terms of you need energy to provide the utility of cold and cooling but also thinking about the sort of slightly lesser issue in terms of all the gases that we use for refrigeration and, and things at the end of their life and so we've had a series of reports on the cold economy the first one was this policy commission doing cold smarter we had a large london launch um, in, in large part, we think that that report raised the issue on the agenda of UK policy makers and was instrumental in helping us to secure the research funding for the Energy Research Accelerator. And then since then, we've been looking, um, so there's pots of money within the UK, the Global Challenges Research Fund, um, that looks at focusing research money on developing country contexts. So we've been looking at India, we've been looking at the UN Global Goals and how some of the clean coal technologies that we're working on could focus on some of these problems. So I was talking about Dearman um, and their technology. It's a novel engine, um, it's a piston engine. It looks in many ways very similar to an internal combustion engine. Um, here's an actual sort of uh, example of the engine at an exhibition. The difference is that rather than injecting a hydrocarbon fuel and igniting that or compressing it to ignite it, we inject liquid nitrogen into a cylinder, then inject a heat transfer fluid, which is warm. It causes the liquid nitrogen to expand, um, give up its energy, and so we then get combined cold and power. Where might this have an application? In the UK, there's a regulatory gap around transport refrigeration units so you have a large hgb lorry this is big for the uk i know it's tiny compared to the road trains that you have over here but you have a very highly regulated um, engine that drives the lorry forward the diesel engine that runs the transport refrigeration unit because it's subject to a completely different set of regulation um, is regulated to a much lower level so you have the irony that this small engine that only maybe uses 20% of the diesel is producing in some cases more emissions than the engine that's providing motive power for the lorry. And there's going to be massive growth in um, refrigerated transport. This is, this is some of Dearman's statistics and estimates. And so we've got big problems with urban air quality because of the levels of NOx and particulate matter. And so what Dearman is saying is that actually um, we can put a Dearman engine in instead of a diesel transport refrigeration unit. The logistics in terms of infrastructure are simpler with, with clean cold because refrigerated transport tends to be from a small number of points to points. So it goes from a, a cold warehouse to a supermarket. It's not necessarily going you know, door to door or from lots of consumers' homes to lots of different locations. So in terms of infrastructure rollout, potentially there's less challenges than say electric hydrogen vehicles. Um, and this could be a, a technology that allows us to clean up um, urban centres. So if you can take these diesel transport refrigeration units out of city centres, that's the niche market in which you can deploy this technology economically to begin with. And so as part of the policy commission reports, which are on the PDFs on the memory stick, we've produced a couple of scenarios. This is our one for the developed world. There's another one for the developing world around what might a world with clean cold technologies look like as opposed to how we presently do things. Um, and, and sort of, you know, thinking back to that slide, um, with there was like a large skyscraper with lots of individual air conditioning units and just on the way over to us came via hong kong and you know you see these massive tower blocks with lots of individual inefficient 
um, cooling units just bolted onto the side of the units. And so it's thinking about if we take a whole systems perspective, how might we do cold and cooling differently? So putting that in a box and, and moving on and looking at some of our other collaborations in the thermal space, um, obviously we hear Australian German Climate and Energy College um, with the context of Brexit, we're increasingly looking at how we might encourage more European partnerships to enable the UK to be resilient in a, in a post-Brexit world. And one of the things that we've been doing is looking at partnership with Fraunhofer, um, obviously a big German research organisation. We've got specific interests around a technology called thermocatalytic reforming, um, which Fraunhofer have been developing We've got a demonstrator here at Birmingham on the Tysley Energy Park, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. This flyer is in the pack of PDF documents that's floating around. Um, it's a pyrolysis technology that uses an Archimedes screw to control the residency of organic matter um, within the column. Um, it produces synthetic liquid fuels and um, also hydrogen and syngas from a wide range of organic feedstocks um, and it's quite tolerant also of moisture in the feedstocks. So this we think is an interesting technology. For Tysley Energy Park, one of the defining features of the area that I'm going to talk about later is it's not just focused around energy, it's also around waste. So we're trying to market Tysley as Birmingham's energy waste nexus. And this is one of the technologies that we think could be key to dealing with the city's waste in a much more intelligent and joined up way. So I'm going to flash over now to a little video that talks about some of our ambitions around Tysley, and it's that one on the end. We'll be with you momentarily. Just amuse yourselves for a moment. Birmingham's Energy Institute in the University of Birmingham is working in close partnership with the Fraunhofer in Germany to deliver the new thermocatalytic reforming technology to market. This technology converts all types of residual biomass and plastic wastes arising from households, agriculture and industry into easily storable and transportable biofuels for vehicles and combined heat and power applications. Renewable energy technologies are becoming increasingly important in these times of climate change and the Fraunhofer Institute has developed a new process based on the efficient use of biogenic residues. TCR, or thermocatalytic reforming, benefits from high feedstock flexibility and can take a range of problematic organic wastes including animal manure, agricultural residues, straw and husk, food waste, organic waste, sewage sludge, municipal solid waste and biogas digestate. The TCR technology site is at Tysley in Birmingham. Various biomasses and biomass residues can be transported into the site by lorry or barge. They are unloaded and used as feedstock for the TCR technology. The TCR converts the biomass residues into gas phase, liquid phase and char, all of which are of unique quality. The char can be used for co-firing in power plants and also in agriculture as fertilizer. 
after refinery, the fuel we produce can be used in cars, both petrol and diesel engines, and even as jet fuel for the aviation industry. Finally, in the gas phase, the hydrogen can be used to create electricity in combined heat and power plants, as well as being used in hydrogen fuel cells and as fuel for cars and trains. Today is a significant day as it marks the delivery of our first demonstrator to the City of Birmingham at Tysley Energy Park. The Energy Park will combine all types of new and existing renewable energy technology to produce green fuels for the City of Birmingham. The Energy Park is one of a number of energy innovation zones within the energy capital, a new vision that aims at making the West Midlands one of the world's leading destinations for energy innovation and investment. Phase one of the energy park has seen the delivery of a 10 megawatt wood gasifier and this reactor will be linked to the second phase of development on the low carbon refueling station. Our thermocatalytic reforming technology is not only part of the energy park but is also part of the Birmingham Thermal Belt which is a concept first coined by Professor Andreas Hohner in 2008 to realize 20 decentralized biomass conversion plants around the cities. This particular reactor, which you can see behind me, will convert up to 80 kilograms an hour of biomass and plastic residues into bio-oil, hydrogen, rich synthesis gas, and biochar for energy generation and value-added chemicals. And this is funded by a 60 million pound Innovate UK Energy Research Accelerator. Being part of Synergy Research Accelerator and having located here at Tysley Energy Park, we have now the right setup to deliver the thermal belt for Birmingham including 15 to 20 units of TCR technology, taking residue material from all over the place and delivering green hydrogen, green fuel, and green power to the city. So I think there's, there's a couple more videos, but what I'm gonna do, um, just to make things simple, is try and breeze through the presentation and maybe we'll return to those at the end, um, depending on time. Tell you what, if we stop that, because if not, we're going to have that in the background. Or is it gone? Brilliant. Super, we're back in the room. Um, so, um, talking about the research that's going on at Birmingham. We've got the Birmingham Centre for Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Research. I covered things there a little bit earlier in terms of talking about our on-campus refuelling station. Um, this is our Hyundai X35. These are the micro cabs, the fuel cell labs at the university. Um, there's work ongoing there. Um, within the business school, we've got the Birmingham Centre for Energy and Environment, Economics and Management. One of the areas of research at the moment is looking at um, lithium prices, um, looking at recycling of lithium from electric vehicle batteries and how that might affect the economics of the lithium supply chain, um, doing a techno-economic evaluation of some technologies that we're investigating to find what, what are the price points at which those technologies become economically viable for recycling electric vehicle batteries. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. That links in with the Birmingham Centre for Strategic Elements and Critical Materials, which we launched earlier this year. So it's looking at in our energy transition, there's going to be demand for new types of material, um, looking at neodymium in um, magnets for generators, wind turbines, looking at some of the materials that are used in LEDs to give unique light emitting properties, looking at um, lithium cobalt for electric vehicle batteries. And so in the US, you've got the Critical Materials Institute. Um, I know I'm going to go and see some people at UTS that are also interested in critical materials, recently published something in the conversation. I don't know if there's interest here at Melbourne as well. It would be really good to join up some dots. Um, but it's really looking at some of these challenges. So um, we're trying to emulate this idea that in the US you've got Critical Materials Institute. In the UK we saw a real gap. Um, that no one was had a research institute that was really focused on this issue. So one of the things that we're going to do with this is a policy commission, um, similar to doing Cold Smarter, but to look at the UK's need for elements, um, element strategy for the UK, if you will. And obviously this is particularly poignant at the moment 
um, our politics at the moment in the UK um, is in transition. There's talk of Brexit. I don't know if that will happen or not. You know, there's a lot of instability and fierce debate. Um, but certainly if we do end up going down that road, it takes us out of the European Union where we've considered our critical material challenges in the context of. And so we might have to look at different ways of doing things if we go it alone. Um, so, yeah, this is... Uh, I'm, I'm going to move on past this because this will be covered in the video later, but um, some of the elements that we're looking at across the university, uh, different scientists working on different areas. So we'll return to that video later. Um, but this is what the UK, um, what the EU list of critical elements looks like at the moment. Um, lots of these are key um, to different energy technologies. And um, why are elements um, critical? Well, lots of issues around um, environmental penalties for extraction, um, there's not a sufficient resource within the nation, the geopolitics, different people having ownership over different um, resources, um, problems around recycling, so it might be that the technologies aren't sufficiently developed, or it might be that those critical materials are so finely dispersed by the time that they end up in end user products that they're difficult or um, expensive to recover those. Um, concentration within one area or expanding marketplaces so you know we've seen explosive growth for cobalt around um, you know the electric vehicle transition and then suddenly that puts lots of pressures all down the supply chain stockpiling is another one so we look at china and its control and manipulation of the markets around rare earths that creates lots of challenges around the world for people who want to use rare earth magnets and they use their dominant position in the marketplace to take control of an ever greater portion of the supply chain so this is looking at um, china one of the big places where heavy and light rare earths are produced and it just shows from the sort of satellite image um, you know, the, the ruinous effect of rare earth extraction. I think one of the reasons, not, not just in terms of deposits, why China has obviously become a dominant supplier of rare earths is that their sort of permissive attitude towards using some really quite ruinous um, methods of um, rare earth extraction, you know, spraying acid and chemicals onto mountains and just leaching out the material and then allowing it to settle and, and dry. And so we can see if we look, you know, progression over time, um, you know, rare earth production. And I'm sorry again for, um, you know, we're, we're missing a little bit with the change of fonts, but we can see, you know, in, in the past several decades, China has really come to completely dominate the marketplace for rare earths, which are increasingly important. Um, it's not all about rare earths, obviously, um, freezing through the list there. Um, lots of different technologies that are used in, new energy technologies um, and so we've got a whole diverse um, multitude of challenges around different critical materials that we're going to need in the energy transition and so what we see is that as, as we move towards increasing penetration of new energy technologies because of the constraints along the supply chain uh, we see unpredictable prices spikes in raw material prices and, and this obviously if, if we can't manage that supply chain can really impact um, our ability to transition to these new technologies as the cost of the technology increases because of the raw materials um, so neodymium and dysprosium that are both used in um, permanent magnet electric vehicle motors um, wind turbine generators you know, there's been real challenges there in the past and, and European manufacturers, so specifically companies like Siemens that are looking at deploying lots of offshore wind in the UK at the moment are very, very interested in rare earth magnet supply and how we can um, try and introduce technologies that might help balance the marketplace and take out some of the um, Chinese dominance, for want of a better word. And so looking and, and focusing on rare earth materials specifically um, at the university we've undertaken a market analysis that looks at all the different sectors that are currently using rare earths and it's trying to focus on those sectors um, where, where there's an opportunity in the near term. And so if you look, for example, at generators in wind turbines, um, they're potentially a massive win down the line because around three tonnes of um, rare earth magnet material are used in some of the new large offshore wind turbines 
but we're only just starting to deploy those turbines and so the end of life opportunities aren't going to come until a couple of decades down the line. We're also on a journey in terms of scaling up the technology. So we have a technology that I'm going to talk to you about around recycling rare earth magnets and obviously we're working to take that from the lab to scale that up to ever larger um, sort of volumes. And so at the moment we're quite interested in what are things that are a near-term market application that works at a smaller scale, first of all. So at the moment, it's looking at things like hard disks, loudspeakers, pumps, where there is already a big scrap resource. Hard disks, especially in terms of obsolete computer technology, there's loads of that out there. We work with a company in Sweden where for many, many years now, they've been disassembling end-of-life computers stockpiling the hard disks in warehouse in the hope that there will be a recycling technology down the line which can recover these magnets um, that technology is here now in terms of pumps um, you know pump life cycle of 10 to 15 years in the eu we've recently had directives around energy efficiency that have led to a transition to um, different types of pumps with a greater permanent magnet um, content more efficient pumps and so there's going to be some time before these start making it back into um, the sort of recycling chain. And again, with electric vehicles, that's an opportunity for the longer term where we need to be ready to look at how we're going to recycle electric vehicles. But at the moment, volumes are still fairly low. So recycling rare earth magnets, um, a couple of big projects, ReproMag and SusMag, that have been focused on this process. And... Um, yep, we've, we've talked about wind turbines and, and the large quantity of rare earth magnets in offshore wind turbines. Um, so difference between on, onshore and offshore, obviously if you build something offshore, it's much more difficult and expensive to maintain than an onshore wind turbine. So whereas on an onshore wind turbine, you might use an induction generator and a gearbox to, to, to speed up the rotation of the wind turbine to a speed that's suitable for a generator. Offshore gearboxes are something that require maintenance, they fail, and so it's worth paying a price premium for an offshore wind turbine to reduce the maintenance needs of that. And that's why permanent magnet offshore generators have become more popular. Going back down, we're looking at hard disk drives. Um, they're something that we've got a big supply of. They're small, they work at the scale at which the technology um, currently exists. And if you look at a hard disk, there's a couple of key magnets here. One of them is in the voice coil and one of them is in the spindle motor in the centre. We've been focusing on the voice coil because it's a very easy magnet to extract with our process. And the challenge is that you've got this sort of sintered magnet that exists within these two plates. It's all bonded together with a, you know, an epoxy resin, something like that. So to get that magnet out of there, um, if you were to do it manually, there would be a lot of disassembly, which is very labor intensive. So at the moment, they just take hard disks and they throw them into a shredder and the shredder churns around and you end up with a, a mixture of metals and this magnetic dust that just sticks to everything. And if you've got a big, steel shredder um, with like you know lots of fine bearings and, and, and parts there that dust gets into all of the mechanism and you end up having to service your shredder an awful lot because it just forms an abrasive that wears everything down um, and ruins the technology so at the moment the magnet is a problem it's not an opportunity um, and you can see here is an example of where the magnet powder is gumming up the works and creating lots of problems there this is our process, it's different. Um, it uses hydrogen to decrepitate the magnet, so it turns it into a hydride which is non-magnetic. Um, at the moment, the, the magnet is coated with nickel, um, which provides a sort of barrier to the oxygen. And the nickel's a problem because if you end up with the recycled products contaminated with the nickel, um, the, the magnet material isn't very, very useful. However, with this process, um, the hydrogen decrepitates the magnet, which causes it to expand and to form a non-magnetic dust. The nickel then flakes off, and the flakes are sufficiently big that you can actually sift them out. 
and, and the way that this works in terms of the technology, this is the current state of the technology at the scale at which it works. You recognize this is a washing machine drum. Um, we slice off the corners of the magnets robotically. They all get put into a washing machine drum. They go here inside this hydrogen environment where the hydrogen decrepitates the magnet, the drum spins, the dust drops out into the bottom into a collection vessel for further processing. So in terms of the recycling process, we need to get the magnets out of the hard disks in a way that's quick and efficient because we can't have a labour intensive process because of the cost. So another university that we work with developed this whole vision system whereby there's an array of sensors underneath the um, platform. The hard disks, they come from the warehouse, they get thrown onto the conveyor belt, they get sorted, so they come along one by one. The sensor array identifies the corner where the rare earth magnet's located. Um, the vision system looks at the orientation of the hard disk as it comes along the platform. Then there's a robot platform here, which you can see in this video here, picks up the hard disk, orientates it in the correct orientation for the chopper on this side, which then just slices off the corners automatically. The corners drop into one box, the hard disks drop into another box. The other box of hard disks is great because the magnets have largely been removed. You can dump that then into the shredder and you can shred those and recover the aluminium and the other materials. Um, and then you've got a box that's just corners that are obviously nice and dense and feed well into the decrepitation process. So that's that. And then you look at the material that's extracted and you look at it on this stage here and you can see the sort of big flakes of nickel that are very easy to separate physically from the rare earth magnet. You can see this cross section through the process magnet. You can see where the hydrogen's coming in here and it's starting to decrepitate and break apart the material. And then here, it's just a, a sieve and some ball bearings and that agitates and the magnet material drops out and then the nickel can be separated. So this is one example of a process at the university where we're looking at the energy transition. We're looking at the new technologies that are going to come on stream and trying to anticipate some of the challenges um, around these technologies and what do we need to do? What's the sort of supporting research um, to enable us to produce those technologies economically? And so the other big one is looking at the sort of whole package of electric vehicles, what's different from conventional vehicles. Well, there's, there's motors, but then there's also batteries. And the UK government has announced massive investment into research around lithium ion batteries. Um, we sort of, you know, as a nation, trying to prepare ourselves in terms of industrial strategy for what things might look like post Brexit. Within um, that Faraday challenge, one of the components is around circular economy, looking at battery recycling. And again, this fits really well with our portfolio of other research. So thinking about how we might recycle automotive batteries at the end of life. Similar challenge to the hard disks in that you need to extract it in a way that's economical. You can't have lots of manual labour unbolting things. Um, there's also a challenge there in terms of safety. So um, we've seen sort of videos on YouTube of electric vehicle crashes. Um, you know, it's well publicised in the news around um, Samsung batteries, you know, on planes when they turn nasty um, and the high energy density of lithium and how that can pose a fire hazard. And so vehicle recyclers are really concerned because they're saying, well, actually, we're starting to get the odd crashed hybrid car through and one or two electric vehicles and there's a real challenge in knowing what to do with it because if it's a petrol vehicle we just take the plug out of the tank drain off the fuel and then you know we can put that vehicle in a crusher the crushers are fairly resilient you know you can put a propane tank in a crusher and it will blow up but the crusher will be unharmed because they're such a big bit of kit but if you start looking at crushing lots of lithium batteries then you've got some real challenges in terms of waste processing so the vehicle recycling industry is saying we need solutions for the end of life with electric vehicles. So we're saying we take the vehicle, first of all we want to triage the battery, so understand what's the state of that battery. Is it something that's suitable for a reuse application or is it something that's really fit for the scrap heap and needs to be recycled? And some of that reuse might be around remanufacture. So at the moment, we've got a battery, 40 cells, for example, they're all glued together and it's something that's very difficult to try and remanufacture. 
how might we design electric vehicle batteries for remanufacture? Is there a way that we can make something modular? So if one cell in a pack of 40 turns bad, we can just identify that cell, replace that cell, and then have the battery have a second life in vehicle applications. So that's one component of reuse. The other component of reuse is obviously, it's a vehicle battery, it used to do 300 miles, it now only does 150. That's not a level of performance that's acceptable to a Tesla buyer, for example, but can we stick that into the grid? But then there's the, if it really is knackered and we can't do anything with it, what might we do then? So it's removing it from the vehicle. Um, we need to do that in a way that's automated. So we've got really good, strong robotics groups at the University of Birmingham um, that are looking at using automation vision systems for reprocessing of nuclear waste, which at the moment, again, is a very, even with robots, it's still very labor intensive because you've got human operators that are having to control and steer the arms. So they're saying with vision systems, how might we slice open a can of nuclear waste, sort the bits, um, using more automation to be able to distinguish between different things. So that robotics research group within the university are now looking, if we get the funding, at the challenge of how can you take a vehicle, identify the type of battery, the points where that battery is fixed to the vehicle, remove that in an automated way, then the battery goes on to the next part of the process. How then can we recycle that battery? And given that you know it's, it's about the lithium, it's about the cobalt, it's also about the organic matter in there, plastics and the electrolytes. The plastics and electrolytes we can feed into the TCR process that Fraunhofer have developed, and we think we can recover some useful um, you know fuels from the end of that process. And then it's looking at physical, chemical biological and pyrometallurgical recovery processes for the other materials within the battery. So if it's the aluminium or the copper, that's fairly easy. We know what to do with that. When it comes to the lithium and the cobalt at the moment, quite a lot of that goes through plasma processes, which consume a lot of material in the process of recovery. So we're looking at different technologies. How can we do things differently? Um, there are biological methods of metal recovery. So there's a group within the university that are looking at road dust. So how can you fish um, water from out of the side of a highway in the gully part of a drain, which can have platinum concentrations as low as six parts per million from the catalytic converters of vehicles, put that into a biological process that pulls out the platinum group metals and turns them into a value added product. So this is looking at how can we perhaps leverage some of those technologies for the reprocessing of electric vehicle batteries. Yeah, sorry, sorry. yeah. Yeah, I'll crack on then. So, T era, I was talking earlier about the manufacturing of the Diamond engine. We're looking at Industry 4.0 um, around the manufacturing of that engine. Energy capital was alluded to with the um, Tysley Energy Park. So this is our regional initiative that's looking at how to make the West Midlands a focal point for energy and energy innovation. There's another video here. We can circulate the link um, with the other things. That might be a quicker way of doing that. So this is our current um, policy commission report around energy capital, energy innovation zones. I've been talking to Martin about this earlier. I'll talk to Roger a bit later on. It would be good to get some feedback. This is a diagram that's also on the documents that will be circulated around so you can look at your leisure. Um, this is Tysley Energy Park, and this is looking at a range of different things that are going on within the Birmingham Energy Institute. How can we bring these together in one physical location in the West Midlands? Um, that back there, yeah, just Chinese brochure. We're looking at more international partnerships. We've got a good footprint um, of research collaboration in China. And then this is me. These are my contact details. If there's anything in there that was remotely interesting, um, drop us an email because I'd love to see how we can join some dots. Thank you very much. And questions? <laughs> Just wrapping that up quickly, we've got some time for some questions. A lot in there, obviously. So uh, yeah. hopefully something for everyone. Any questions for Gavin?
look, there's uh, there'd be a lot of work going on in other UK universities. Uh, how are you joining the dots in the UK and into Europe? Yeah, so um, I think within the UK, the Energy Research Accelerator within the Midlands um, has been a real way of us getting out of our silo of saying we're individual institutions competing against each other all the time and trying to look at what are our strengths and to try and identify areas where maybe people can have ownership of a certain territory, if you, if you like, for want of a better word, and how we can work together in a way that's complementary so we're not duplicating each other's research we're sticking to defined areas within the broader energy research agenda. And I think within the UK, um, there's a challenge in which, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, London, what they call the sort of golden triangle. Um, there's some really powerful, strong universities um, that have got real profile in many different areas there, Oxford, Cambridge and the London universities, Imperial, UCL. And it's about saying, OK, with, with the Midlands universities, we might be a little bit smaller in terms of scale. But if we work together, um, we can offer something that's very complementary. I think in terms of Europe, um, things are a little bit more challenging now. Historically, we've had fantastic collaborations with the EU Joint Research Centre. We've found lots of different platforms for um, collaboration on stuff around nuclear decommissioning on critical materials. Um, our challenge now is to think in a different funding environment, how can we keep those links going? And that's partly the rationale for establishing the Fraunhofer Joint Research Platform, because we're hedging our bets there to say, well, actually, we work together um, internationally at the moment, but in the event that the funding environment changes, if we were to have a, a UK platform for that Fraunhofer, it, it provides us different routes for accessing funding, you know, that the German partner can access the EU funding, the UK partner can access the UK funding dimension of that. So I think, um, yeah, th th there's lots of questions there in terms of positioning, obviously. Um, we still want to be competitive. We don't just want to roll over if someone else is working on a different area and we think we've got something to offer. So a really good example of that would be in the recycling space. We thought that we had a really unique offer around electric vehicle battery recycling in terms of the portfolio of technologies. So in that instance, we're competing against Warwick that's a near neighbour because we felt that we were taking a different approach academically to the approach that they were offering. But I think by and large, we try and look at how can we do things in a way that's complementary to existing capacity rather than duplicating capacity. Other question? Thank you, Gavin. It's quite impressive the amount of work that has been done in just three years. And particularly, you've, you've touched into a whole set of topics within, within the research agenda. Independent to the institutional sort of strategic um, dynamics to see how to synergize and not overlap, uh, what has been the logic to establish that research agenda to say, well, our priority is this area, this area. I mean, we've talked about mobility, we've talked about recycling. Uh, uh, is there a specific logic within the energy transition that, that, that the Birmingham Energy Institute has applied to come up with these, these topics? Um, honestly, I think no. I think a lot of the decisions around the areas of focus have been, I mean, and bear in mind, we're only three years in, you know, so I think there's a move from looking at what was the existing capacity at Birmingham, what were the areas of real sound research strength, what were the clusters of activity that we could build on. Um, so there's a couple of areas like with the economics and management where we saw that there was a good group of academics, but they didn't quite have the critical mass to call themselves a research centre. So we looked at how could we build on some complementary activity to build those to a scale where they could actually be something that was coherent. So I think that's the journey that we've been on so far, is identifying what are our existing strengths and how can we consolidate those. I think strategic elements and critical materials is perhaps a special example, because there, there was the capacity but it was so distributed across the whole institution, it didn't actually sit as a physical group. You know, it was across lots of different schools because the structure of the universities, colleges, and then within those colleges are schools. 
And so there we had to go on a real journey in terms of convincing people, you know, internal stakeholders, that actually there was sufficient activity across the institution and that this was a sufficiently novel offer in the UK context to establish a research centre. And actually, I think the validation of that activity has been that since we created the centre and we held the launch earlier this year, on the back of that, we've just won a network grant. So acting as the sort of hub across a, a range of different UK spokes that can bring complementary activity to the sort of strategic elements and critical materials network. I think there's a bigger question and it's possibly something as we mature and grow as an energy institute and perhaps Melbourne's had a little bit more time to think and consider that long-term strategic perspective in terms of actually where does the transition need to go and what capacity do we need to build to mean that we're supporting that transition. Um, I think that's a journey that we're still on. On one of your earlier slides, you showed the liquefied air storage as yes. an energy storage. What do you reckon as the commercial viability? And Roger can talk to you. So. Yeah. So that particular plant at the University of Birmingham, um, that was the pilot scale plant from Highview. So um, that was the very, very first model that they ever built. It was originally built in Slough. Um, down in West London and then it, then it was taken to bits put on a lorry and shipped up to the university that uses residual waste heat from our university district heating system commercially that plant will operate from bought in liquid nitrogen economically at certain times so for the triads at times of real high demand it works out economically that we can bring in liquid nitrogen from BOC, air liquid, air products, fill up the tank, store it in the tank, and then at the point at which um, we can sell electricity back to the grid. On the triads, that works. Um, in terms of more general trading, there's been a scale up from that size plant to the next size up in Manchester, where they've been looking at landfill gas. So different situation here but you've got landfill gas that's being recovered it's going into combined heat and power um, you know engines the electricity is obviously really easy to export back to the grid because there's a grid connection there the heat is much more challenging because there aren't users of heat in the area as so they looked at that and said well actually we've got a vast resource here in terms of waste heat that we're not making use of and there, there's a really complementary fit for the technology because the waste heat can be used to increase the efficiency of the process for energy storage. If you've got that liquid air energy storage, you can do more clever things in terms of buying and selling from the grid. And so it's that balance there and that tension between the cold and power and the waste heat that, that has enabled them to scale that up. But it's still at a pre-commercial stage, you know, it's still at a stage and, and a journey of scaling up that technology. Um, but they believe that the, the key thing is it's highly scalable and it uses things that are off the shelf. You know, it's not specialist things. It's not processes that need to be developed. It's just validating the technology commercially at different scales. That's, that's the journey that they're on at the moment. On, on that note, when you're talking about critical elements before, yeah. and then you segued very nicely into the fact that liquid air energy storage doesn't use any yeah. critical elements. So, are you seeing that the constraints put on the system because of availability of rare earth elements, is it actually going to see a, a different pathway in terms of how much wind and solar technologies we use versus things like concentrating solar thermal or you know, and you know, liquid air energy storage versus lithium ion storage? Do you, do you see that the, the cost differential will be enough to drive the pathway in a different direction? So I think... And, and these are like my personal thoughts and they're not perhaps supported by research. We're at such an early stage of the energy transition at the moment that we've not really reached in any respect any of these materials constraints where this starts to be a problem and markets are so volatile and so dynamic that they are notoriously hard to predict. And so I think lots of the technologies that we're working on, we're sort of hedging our bets rather than saying that this is definitely a problem right now 
Um, I think the challenges that, I mean, there are still challenges around liquid air energy storage technologies, but they're not necessarily around the availability of the materials um, because obviously it's you know, iron, steel, aluminium and stuff that's readily available. The challenges around the Dearman engine, for example, are around the tribology. Um, so we know how to lubricate engines that work at high temperature. We've got no idea how to do it at low temperature because obviously if you take oil down to cryogenic temperatures, it gums up, it doesn't operate. We need different things, PTFE, graphite, um, different ways of lubricating those engines. So, so there are still technology challenges and barriers, but if we can get over those to increase the longevity of the engines, we've potentially got a solution that can be made very cheaply using existing materials and processes. You know, industry is geared up towards producing cast engine blocks, pistons, um, there are some challenges, so I didn't talk too much, but we were talking about ITAMA, the um, International Thermal Energy Manufacturing Accelerator, where that's funded as part of the Energy Research Accelerator project. And what we're saying is to make that Dearman engine, actually most of it is a motorcycle engine with some modification. It's the cylinder heads where things really start to get different, and it's around the cryogenic piping. And at the moment, because the cryogenic piping is produced for a niche industry at very low scale, um, it's very expensive. And it's not something that's expensive to produce because it's only a bit of metal that's bent to a certain shape. It's just around that scale and that volume. So how can we... It's not just about technology readiness level. It's also about manufacturing readiness level and how can we accelerate that transition. Okay, we've come to the end of the allotted time, unless there's any burning questions, although Gavin's going to be around for a bit longer, so you can grab him after the seminar if you want to chat some more. Uh, please join me in thanking Gavin for a really interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, and this was probably his seminars with the shortest advance notice, so thank you for coming out here. Next Friday, we're going to have a very interesting follow-up um, yeah, so Friday in the 15th, we are going to have a very interesting follow-up, transformation, energy, social innovation, and disruptive smart grid uh, technologies here from Martin, the completion seminar. So next, uh, Friday on the 15th, and then on Monday the 18th, so in two weeks' time, um, we are going to have Luke Kemp here from um, ANU in Canberra. I wanted him to talk about Trump and the Paris Agreement. He wants to, to talk about how the Paris Agreement is destined to fail anyway. Um, so on the 18th of December, we are going to have a very nice provocative discussion here with Lou Kemp, who probably gets his way and talks about how the Paris Agreement and the budgeting up mechanism is destined to fail anyway. And we are hopefully having a good discussion there. All right. Thank you so much, Kevin for a fantastic presentation. Thank you.